Central New York, and she's going to talk about an ancestor of hers, Charles Kellogg. Roxanne, welcome to Morgan Hill and the History House here. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your quest that you're going through right now for Charles Kellogg. Thank you. First of all, I just want to say thank you to everybody that's made my visit here possible. It's a dream come true for me because uh, I am the uh, great grandniece of Charles Kellogg. He was the brother of my great grandfather. Mm. And so I grew up hearing about him, and all my life I wanted to get out here to California and really explore where he lived and what his life was about. What I'm finding is just really beyond my wildest expectation. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about Charles Kellogg. I mean, he has a really uh, roots here in Morgan Hill, but tell us what your quest is about and, and about the man. Okay, well, Charles is an extraordinary uh, person who, to me, was very much ahead of his time. He understood the importance of the environment. He understood what it meant to be truly connected to nature. And after coming out and visiting Quincy, the Quincy area, uh, up in the Sierra Madre where he was born and raised, I understand better why he lived the kind of life that he did. He, uh, as I come to understand it, his first language was bird talk. Bird talk. So, so he was known as the bird man. The nature singer? The so. nature singer, because he could imitate any bird call. He only had to hear it once, and he could imitate it. And he spent his whole life warbling. Wow. And actually, his throat, his uh, vocal cords were examined by a doctor. Uh, and they said that he had a kind of malformation in his vocal cords, so that they were actually the vocal cords of a bird. Wow. <laughs> So he would, he'd hear a bird call or a bird's song and then just imitate it just naturally. So yes. That was sort of a thing back in the, I guess, a uh, hundred years ago where, where vaudeville people would do you know, bird calls and bird songs. Was he, on, he was in vaudeville, I believe? Yes, he was a vaudeville performer. He uh, went east. First, he spent his first, I believe, eight years out here growing up in the wild, being raised up in the Quincy area where his father ran the provision store for several of the gold mines mm -hmm. up there. And his mother left his father when he was only three years old. And so he was raised, he and his brother were basically raised in the wild. Wow. But he was particularly young, he was only three, so he, was, he ran wild with the Indians and with uh, the Chinese people that worked there. And of course they didn't speak much English. So what I understand is he spent so much time in the woods that his first language was actually bird call. Wow. <laughs> so, so he was a wild boy, it says they grew up with, with nature. So. But by the time he was eight, I believe his father must have grew alarmed at what he saw. So he decided to uh, take Charles back east to Casanova, New York, where he lived with his aunt, his hmm. father's sister, Mrs. Becker, and her husband. And they um, raised him. Now, he, in his autobiography, he totally skips over that period, except to say how much he learned from his uncle, who was a master woodsman, uh, woodworker. And he could make fantastic uh, pieces of furniture. So Charles did learn how to make furniture from him, but the furniture he made was completely rustic. And he made it from logs and pieces of bark and wood uh, that he found. Um, you know, and recycled. 
but, but that skill he kept with him. In fact, he went on to teach other people that skill later on. So that was a culture shock for a young boy. What, what, how, when was he born? I think the 1868, was it? Yes, actually, I wish I had the book with me. I could give you exact dates. I'm, I think I'm it was 1868, when I recall. And uh, so for that period, to go from pure nature boy to kind of a civilization, I guess. Back east. Yeah. And then we know that he did spend one year at Syracuse University, which, was, which is my alma mater. I did um, my... BA, MA, and PhD at Syracuse. So I was very excited to find out so that is, he had gone there. Is he a legend like at Syracuse? Did no. Know? Oh, really? No one knows about him there. That's interesting. And um, when I was up in the Redwoods, I found a flyer that he had started a men's chorus while he was at Syracuse at Krause College. And they must have performed because we saw the flyer from their performance. But it was the same year that he got his first gig at Chautauqua. And I think they loved him at Chautauqua. So he must have thought, why should I stay in school when I can just be out performing? And I think that's when his vaudeville career began. Wow. And he was a handsome young man, and I'm sure the women loved him. And he was just a hit from the beginning. He was so many things. He was like a Renaissance man. So after he uh, went east, I'm not sure whether he came back again and then went back. I know he toured around a lot. But he ended up somehow with his brother in a place called New Remain. And New Remain is near Bethel, Maine. It's up in the mountains. Uh, it's kind of north, uh, north near the New Hampshire border. And there he opened a nature camp. Oh, wow. And apparently people used to come up from Philadelphia, Boston, and New York to vacation in that region. So he came up and he used to give talks and I think he started recruiting people to come and spend the summer in his camp. So they built by hand a series of cabins, all connected by a bird walk, a bird walk, a board walk, board walk. and then a big central building where they all ate together with a huge fireplace, of course, because one of the features of Charles is he loved building fireplaces. So um, the camp, had a waterfalls nearby, Step Falls, which became the first park set aside, um, donated to the nature, the Maine Nature Conservancy. Oh wow! And today it's a it's a Nature Conservancy park, and it is literally Steps Falls. And at the top, he had built an outdoor kitchen and a flume out of wood where they would take water from the waterfalls right down into the camp. So the camp had running water, it had electricity that, I can't remember what they said, how they generated it, it was some unusual system. He was very interested in the latest technologies. Wow. You know, that's an amazing, you know, he, he reminds me a little bit of John Muir, who was, who was into technology and invention too, but he went out there in the woods and, and Yosemite, so, so there might be a connection between technology and, and you know, love of nature. Yes, but it was appropriate technology, because it was always, it wasn't just something new for the sake of new. What was new, could you could harness nature, but in a way that was respectful of it, because he was such a... Um, he really respected nature, a great lover of nature, very much ahead of his time. Definitely. He was basically, he was a vegetarian when he was home, but I do believe that when he was out of his home, he didn't inconvenience people like I do uh, with, the, with his vegetarianism. Because I, when I was growing up, I always used to hear my grandfather say, Oh, you're just like Uncle Charlie. Because whenever, you know, I'd have a different idea or I'd express a different opinion. Oh, you're just like Uncle Charlie. He said, he wouldn't eat meat, but boy, he sure would pour on the gravy. <laughs> <laughs> so he loves so, gravy. So. <laughs> that's what he said. Huh? And, uh, you know, I grew up hearing, oh, you're as crazy as Uncle Charlie. Whenever I had a sort of alternative idea, you know, that was out of the mainstream. So maybe from a young age, it set up a kind of resonance with him. Oh, yeah.
that later on, you know, just has been so, so enriching yeah. for my life. Well, he was an unusual man for his time in Victorian times. I mean, it was kind of prim and proper, but he grew up in the uh, the woods essentially, and and used a lot of his knowledge, I guess, to you know develop his career as a nature singer, vaudeville. Mm -hmm. He toured the world a bit. Yes, but you know what he used to do on vaudeville was he would they would have an elaborate set, you know, and that's how they did on vaudeville. They loved the elaborate sets, and they would have the set of the woods. And he would come walking out, singing his bird song. And then he would proceed to talk about the need to live in harmony with nature. And he would start a fire on the stage using a method with uh, two pieces of wood. One was stationary and the other was like in a hole. I, there's probably a term for it. And he would use his boot laces to move it like this to create a spark. But he would pride himself on the fact that he would not use any what was called punk, right? Punk apparently was some kind of small like sawdust type material that would catch fire. He prided himself on being able to do it without punk and by breathing the spark into a flame. So it was something he would do with his breath. And he understood about breath and life. Which, of course, I've been involved in yoga now for like 30-some years, and I really understand breath and life and vegetarian and also even the vibrations, which was another great thing he loved. He used to do uh, experiments in sound with his voice, with the bird call, where he would make a flame dance in a Bunsen burner using his bird call with the vibrations of his voice, he would make the flame dance, and then he would actually extinguish it. Wow. And he did this uh, with a professor of physics at Berkeley, and they did it not only live in front of people, but they also did it over the radio, on a radio now, show. Now, I can't believe that. That is so incredible, that they, he, his voice came out of the radio box and extinguished... A flame. Wow. Like 30 miles away, or I can't remember, but they... It was written up in the papers, and it came, uh, many people who listened to it on the radio sent him letters about what had happened. Wow. They were holding candles in front of the radio, <laughs> and they claimed that the candles went out with his voice, too. So, so who knows? Yeah. I mean, you know, they. I think that they tried to check that out on some website. Myth, Mythbusters, actually. Mythbusters. Yeah. And what, but they said it was inconclusive, that they couldn't disprove it. Hmm. And when I was up at the Redwoods last week, they said that some physicists came there. You might want to check with Dave up there at Humboldt State Park. A physicist came and said that now physics has an explanation oh, wow. as to how, why it would be possible to do that. So physics allows it. So yes. So I guess there is a certain frequency that maybe the flame, you know, just can't stand that and, and yeah. it. So. So he, he was into all these things ahead of time. And Kim uh, Moreno, who's also done so much research on um, Charles Long, I mean Charles Kellogg, he's done www.charleskellogg.com, I believe. He also said that Charles had um, done these experiments and that they have not yet been disproven either. Mm -hmm. So, some interesting science from the man. So, yes. so how did he arrive here in Morgan Hill? I mean, what's the connection for, for him to come to Morgan Hill? That's a good question. I have no idea because his family was up further up into the mountains. So how he came here, I don't know. I was hoping that you guys could tell me that. Oh. <laughs> well, did you, you took a tour of the house that he and his wife, and what was his wife's name? Uh, Sadie. Sadie. As far as I know. Oh. Because he actually had a wife back east, Clara, and they used to sing together because we found the, fi the uh, flyers. His, when he had the camp in Maine, she was with him, and she was from Philadelphia and had a music store mm -hmm. and was a musician, a contralto herself. And she used to sing, and he would do the bird call along with it in harmony, which we have some records, not of her singing, but of some other famous opera singers from the time uh, doing that. Um, but he left her, apparently, at the camp, and that's when the camp closed in Maine. He left the camp, he ran off with another woman, that was Sadie, and he ran to California. And 
Why he chose Morgan Hill to settle, I really don't know. That's maybe the mystery. Yeah, so. But I think Morgan Hill at that time was a pretty wild place. It wasn't very settled. Uh, it wasn't like it is today. What year was that, or what period was that? Um, that was in the early teens. So early teens. So, so yeah, this town started, uh, it was, uh, became a town in 1906. So it would have been that period. Where, very you know, young, yeah. very young place. And he lived in a place called the Mushroom. And there's a picture here in the museum of the mushroom. And just today, we determined that that was likely on the site of where the house that uh, Gertrude Strong Achilles, his benefactress, built him at a house. And we just visited the house today at Fountain Oaks. So the, the mushroom is, is not no longer around. But no. Why did they call it the mushroom? Well, because it was built like a mushroom in a sort of round shape. And inside it was one big room, and in the middle he had a movable fireplace, which was more like a campfire on wheels. Oh, wow. And the reason that I think that the mushroom must have stood in the same place that the house is now, the patio, is because that movable fireplace remained there in the pictures that we saw. Remained once uh, the mushroom wasn't there anymore. Mm. So, so it's just down. a hunch I have. Yeah. yeah, the mushroom burnt, I knew that. And the top of it had a cupola with open sides and a, like a roof that was slanted so that when it rained, the water wouldn't come in. But he made it so that when you had an open fire in the fire pit, it would suck out the top without making the room smoky. Wow. Because he liked to live in one big room. He liked to have skylights. He wanted to have everything that he needed at hand because his theory was don't waste your time on housework when you can be outside enjoying nature. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so uh, his connection was Gertrude, Gertrude Achilles, the heiress to the Kodak fortune. How did that happen? Where, where did they meet? Well, they met in Hawaii, as I understand it. Again, thanks to Kim, he brought all that uh, to my attention. And he's done a lot of research on it, and he actually wrote a play about it. But she, her sister lived in Hawaii. So she must have been visiting her sister, and Charles must have been performing, and she went to see his performance, and she must have seen in him everything that was the opposite of life as she had known it. Because she was wealthy, she was... You know, her kids were grown. She was probably looking, like many of us at this age, looking for like a higher meaning. And she just was uh, fascinated with him. So she came from money, affluence, you know, wealth through her, you know, her father, George Eastman. And then she came out to California and met this kind of a, a wandering guy, a wanderlust, or wandering guy. Mm -hmm. And Wanderlust is wander about right. <laughs> and, and basically, you know, probably did she fall in love with him, or what was the relationship? Well, who knows, but there had to have been something going on there, you know. Um, he, her dad, though, was not George Eastman. It was Mr. Strong, who actually was the first person to invest in George Eastman's vision. Oh, wow. The two of them founded Eastman Kodak because her dad had the money, Mr. Strong had the money, and George Eastman had the ideas. And, the, and that's why today, Rochester, New York, every other thing is strong this, strong that. Wow. So, yeah, it's a big name in so Rochester. So they have a lot of wealth. They came out, she came out here and she built a beautiful home now that the Kiala family owns. So. Yes, a beautiful home. And when I was there today, what really struck me was the contrast between the way she lived and the way Charles lived. And really their personalities were so opposite. Because in his autobiography, he talks about how he just doesn't like to spend any time in a modern hotel or a modern home. He wants to be in a cabin. He wants to be with a campfire. Anything that's reminiscent of being in the woods is what he loves. And so when I saw the home that she built for Sadie and him, I thought, wow, Charles really compromised by staying here. And then one of the women from here said, well, you know, he used to stay down in his camper. And he'd come up to the house. Well, let's talk about the RV that he built. I guess he made the very first recreational vehicle. <laughs> yes, he did, yeah. <laughs> Which is ironic because we had a company here in Morgan Hill that made recreational vehicles. Really? So, yeah. Uh, is it Mervyn, Urban Perch? 
he made a kind of, I guess, the Winnebago's. So, <laughs> so is it Winnebago's? Wow, that's interesting. And so it's ironic that the man who uh, kind of invented the recreational vehicle came here um, years before him. So He got the idea of, I think, just living inside a log. And so he took a fall in Redwood. And actually, Dave up at the museum in Humboldt just recently located the tree, the fallen tree. They're going to put a plaque there in the park. This is the, took him six years to find it. He found the tree that they cut the section out of to make the travel log. It was humongous. They had to, and the uh, Pacific Lumber Company respected Charles. He had good relations with them. They lent two of their best axemen to help with the project. And they, uh, because the center was a little, um, he describes in his book about how they ground out the center and then slowly carved it out. And then he said that laying on his back, he carved out the whole thing. Now, I don't know, maybe he's exaggerating, but they, they carved that thing out to four inches and then cut it into shape. And they got a Nash body, which was used for tanks during World War I put the log on top of the Nash, thanks to Mr. Nash, who believed in the project, put this, uh, I believe it weighed four tons, and put it on top of this Nash body and wow. drove it across the country to raise money for war bonds. Now that was the ostensible cause. I think that's how he could justify it. But they said wherever he went, he also talked about the need to save the Redwoods. So the travel log, I mean, it was essentially it had a bed, probably a shower, a bath, a little table, uh, and, yep. and he drove it around. Did people go inside of it? Did yes, they... people could go in it, and, and he made beautiful cabinets on one side, because he did learn that cabinetry from his uncle, and he made beautiful cabinets in there. And there's like a little cab in the front, and the steering wheel, I noticed the steering wheel is like this. Instead of like this, you know, we're used to steering wheels like this. This was like this. It's almost like a <laughs> And somebody said that it, um, they, oh, it was Dave up there again. And he said he's driven it. He said there's no shocks in it whatsoever. Oh, so so you're, it's like, you know, you really rattle. He said it rattles your brain. Yeah. So can you imagine? I think they did put it on a train to take it partway across the country and then he'd, he'd take it down and drive it around on the East Coast and take it on the train and bring it back to the West Coast. So it's not as if he drove over the Rockies in this thing. Yeah. I don't think it would have been possible. But nonetheless, it was impressive because wherever he went, he could talk about nature, he could talk about the Redwoods, raise money for the war effort, and um, generally promote himself by doing bird calls. And during one of those trips uh, east, my mom was about eight years old, and she remembers him visiting with, my, with her family. That would have been his nephew. And my grandmother always used to tell me about how, because my grandmother played piano, so she sat at the piano and he asked her to play some song. I wish I remember which, which song. And she played it, and he stood next to her, and he did the bird. Wow music in harmony. And whenever my grandmother would tell me that story, her eyes would fill with tears at the memory because she really, you know, that visit was, I think they felt special because he gave a program in Clifton Springs, New York, which was a big uh, spa. It was uh, where people would go for healing baths in those days. And um, so they sat in the front row and he did his bird calls. And she said afterwards she remembers going in the travel log and he started it with his voice. Oh, he started it? With his so voice. So the ignition was his voice. <laughs> was his voice. <laughs> and was I don't it? know how they did that in those days. Yeah. But he did it and she said even my father was impressed. Because my, um, my grandfather was not always the biggest fan of his uncle. He always thought he was a bit crazy. So when he used to tell me, you're just like Uncle Charlie, it wasn't a compliment. Right. It was like, you're really out there. You know? <laughs> yeah. But I always kind of took it as a, as a compliment. And I remember I was the only one of the grandkids who was interested in that green book that was hanging around, The Nature Singer. So I, when I got a little bit older, I started asking my grandmother about the book. So she started telling me a little bit about him, and by the time I was a teenager, I read the book, 
And when I graduated from college, she gave me one of her, she had two copies, she gave me one of those copies, which I still have. And you know, it's amazing, he was, for his time, he's very famous, he traveled the world, traveled America, had the travel log. Uh, I think he was on Ripley's Believe It or Not. And, he and, was? And so, yeah, I've, I've, I've oh, wow. seen that. And, uh, but for some reason, he just kind of got lost in history and people, other than if you're, you know, a history buff here at Mor Morgan Hill or really into Charles Kellogg, most people have never heard of him. Well, you know, one of, one of the ways that I sort of got reawakened my interest in him was when I went to India. And I went to India when I was an undergraduate. I spent a year there. Um, and I was just, there were no other Americans. I was just living with Indian families. And I really became completely Indian while I was there. And it's a big part of my identity today. I speak two Indian languages. I did my PhD in Indian studies. So India is my other <laughs> world. But while I was there, I read a book called Autobiography of a Yogi. I don't know if you're familiar with it. But it's about uh, Paramahamsa Yogananda, who has, who started Self-Realization Fellowship, and they have these big gardens near Hollywood, near the Will Rogers House in um, L.A. And so Paramahamsa Yogananda's ashram is there, and his beautiful gardens, if you ever get a chance, those gardens are exquisite. Well, he wrote an autobiography called the Autobiography of a Yogi, and Charles Kellogg is mentioned in it. Wow. So here I am reading this book in India, Autobiography of a Yogi. I'm all interested in yoga and spirituality, and then I see in a footnote Charles Kellogg, <laughs> the nature singer, and he's talking about his early experiments with vibrations. Wow. And so it's, you know, Yogananda is quoting it in a way like having to do with spirituality, and it was just, I couldn't believe that here is my uh, great uncle's name in autobiography. I said, that's my uncle. And they said, really? I said, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's sort of, again, a light went on. It's almost like the universe was saying, hey, here's your <laughs> uncle. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and you know, then I, when I came home, I again picked up the autobiography of my uncle. I read it again, and I was fascinated with it. But I didn't think anything more of it. I just sort of shelved it in my mind. But I thought, oh yeah, you know, I'm also an environmentalist. I'm also into all these things. But I can't sing like a bird. And um, then it, uh, I was uh, telling the story a little earlier that there's a, there's a kind of magical side to Charles even now. Hmm. Because it, t it touched me. So I don't know if you want to hear that story. I definitely do. What, 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 tell us about the magic of Charles Kellogg. <laughs> well, I, w I became involved in Rochester, New York with a group of uh, people that were doing sweat lodges, shamanic drum journeys, and we would meet once a month and we would do ceremonies, you know, like native ceremonies. And, and almost no one there went. Well, a few people were native, but mostly we were non-native, you know. And during one of these drum journeys, um, the first drum journey, we had to go in search of our power animal, mm -hmm. and I discovered that it was a peacock. A peacock? Yes, which made sense, okay? So. I'm proud of the peacock. <laughs> <laughs> so the second one, the second drum journey I went on, they said, okay, this time you're going to go on a journey to find your spirit mm -hmm. ancestor. So it's basically a technique where they drum, you close your eyes, and you just let the drum, sort of the vibrations of the drum, activate your imagination. So you just see whatever comes up in front of your eyes. And as I was sitting there doing this, they said, okay, now you're going to go up the tree. And as you go up the tree, the first thing that you see, that's your spirit ancestor. And I was thinking, oh, maybe it's a tiger or a lion or, you know, something like that. But instead, what I saw was the outline of a man with his hands out like this and with wings. So I'm looking at this outline. I said, that's a bird. Oh, it's a man. And I said, bird man. Oh, my God. Wow. And as soon as bird man came, I was boom, I was in, the, in this cabin with him. You felt like you were in the cabin. Yeah, oh, I saw it. I was there. Wow. It was like a vision, but I was in it. It's like being in a dream, except you're awake. So there I was sitting in the cabin with him, and I said, oh my God, I've always wanted to meet you. And he said, well, I've been waiting for you, he said, and I, 
you know, I've been watching you and I'm pretty pleased with what I've observed and he started talking to me, all these things, and really I can't remember everything he said to me, but I just remember I was in heaven just being able to talk to him like that. And then he, I said, well, one thing I've always wondered, I said, is why, why you left your first wife? And he looked at me and he said, why did you leave your first husband? <laughs> and he started laughing touché. like anything. That's what I said to him. I said, touche. And then like the drum changed, the, the beat changed. And what happens is you're cued so that when the beat changes, you have to return. So it was like when the beat changed, it pulled me back so fast that I couldn't even say goodbye to him. I was just like, woof, I was back. And I opened my eyes and I was just, from that time, I felt his hand in my life. Wow. I mean, it's, it's not like, if I, whenever I think of him, of course, his energy is with me. But there have also been times when just I've been in a situation where maybe I've been a little scared or something. And then he's just there. Like, don't worry. You're right. tough. You can take it. Your you know? astral guardian kind of yes, hovering about yes, you. Yes, very and... much like a guardian from the other side, protector. And now the second story is a really good one. Okay, the first one was. <laughs> yeah, that, that was amazing. But wait till you hear the second one. It's even more verifiable because there's a witness there. Um, I was driving, I, uh, my former partner David and I were driving from... Uh, Bar Harbor, we went up to Bar Harbor to visit my friend, Marsha, and then we were going to just come back along the coast and go back, but at the last minute I said, let's do a different route, let's go and visit some friends of ours in the Adirondacks in New York, and I looked at the map and I said, we should drive straight across Maine and come through Vermont, you know, New Hampshire, Vermont, and then into New York. Well, there's no major road that goes there. So I just used my Google Maps to come up with any route that would take me there. And we followed that. And early in the morning, I started driving. So I had been driving a couple of hours, and I got tired. And I said, okay, now you drive, and I'm going to put the seat back and sleep. And I'm going to sleep for a couple hours because I'm tired. I put the seat back, and it wasn't 15 minutes later that out of a deep sleep, all of a sudden, I just sat up like this, and I flipped the seat up. And just in time to see this sign that said New Remain. New Remain? New Re, N E W R Y, Main, four miles. And it was a small little sign by the road. Huh. And I just said New Remain. And then I said, New Re, oh my God, where have I heard this before? And then I went, oh my God, New Remain, that's where Charles had his camp. I said, we have to stop. So we, it was a Sunday, and we stopped in Newry, and I just, you know, to make a long story short, I asked around, and I found the camp. Wow. And, and my partner, David, got the creep. He got creeped out. He said, oh, my God, he woke you up. He woke you up. Because I was going, he wanted me to see it. He woke me up. He woke, and he did. He woke me up out of a deep sleep and showed me New Remain is ahead. So don't sleep through this town. You have to stop. Wake up. And I stopped, and I went swimming in the waterfalls, and and then I just was hooked. So then, what about three years later, which was last year, some friends of mine were coming from France and wanted us to meet them up in Nova Scotia. I said I can't. And okay, well we're. I said you come to us. No, but we are coming through to Montreal, and we're going to stop in Bethel, Maine. Could you meet us in Bethel, Maine? And I said, Bethel, Maine? Well, that's next door to New Remain. I said, yes, I have some unfinished business there. So again, a coincidence of all the places that they chose that place to go and invited us. So I went up, and that's when I made contact with the Historical Society. Oh, cool. And the people there, you know, they took out the pictures they had, and we exchanged. And then I got in touch with Kim, and then it just started rolling. So that's how I'm here today, is I've been literally led by the hand by Charles. Yeah, it seems like a series <laughs> of synchronous coincidences, if there is a coincidence. Exactly. And uh, just, you're here today, or you're getting videotaped. And so. today, actually, I don't have my purse here, but today, as I was walking through the door to go into the room in, in uh, the guest cottage with the big fireplace that Charles built, and the woodshed, and as I went in, something hit me on the head. It was a little piece of... 
of uh, like the mortar in oh, between wow. the stones. It fell down and hit me. And, <laughs> Charles and, and yes, and it was given to me as a gift. Wow. So I have that cool. with me. A little uh, present to take yeah, home. Yeah, like guess what? Mind. I'm here. I see you. You know, Charles is one of those men that was probably a hundred years before his time, and and, and here we are. You know, the year 2012, talking about environmental issues, climate change, we're having droughts. What would he say to us here in you know the 21st century? What what, what would be the message for from Charles? Well, Charles would have been on the cutting edge of the environmental movement. There's no question about it. I mean, he believed in saving the redwoods. Uh, he he would be all for recycling and conservation and, you know, living simply. He would have abhorred today's uh, emphasis on money and, you know, all these, uh, you know, that profit is the main motive uh, behind everything. Yeah. I mean, he wasn't... Obviously, he understood about the need to compromise with the lumber companies. He had good relations with them, but at the same time, he wanted that balance. The balance, yeah. And I think that he just would have, uh, I think he is very proud of the environmental movement as it exists today. And he, you know, would have been uh, a vegetarian today because it would have been much easier for him. And... Uh, he loved animals, he loved difference, you know. Later in life, he traveled to different countries. He traveled to England, performed for the Queen of England. Wow. He performed his bird calls for Rodin, the sculptor. There's a whole chapter in there about how he spent the day with Rodin in his garden. He also uh, got funding to go to Fiji Islands, where he traveled from island to island, being announced by the drums. Hmm. Ahead of time, the drums. <laughs> they brought back four lolly drums, L A L I drums, because he writes about it. And I don't know what happened to those drums. They may be somewhere around here in Morgan Hill in an antique store, or I don't know where. But uh, he had those at Morgan Hill and used to take them to the schools and give demonstrations and talk about the communication that traditional peoples had through drums. Uh, in his book he talked about how Native Americans had a technique for going to the water and speaking something on the water and the water would take the message to uh, some other people on the other side of the lake. Mm. So he was interested in so many of the cutting edge things that physics is now just starting to explore. Another thing Kim told me is he helped design the acoustics of many of the Christian science chapels oh. around the Bay Area because apparently Sadie and uh, Gertrude Strong, Achilles, were involved with Christian science heavily. Hmm. Because, you know, in those days, Christian science was the cutting edge of he the healing arts. Yeah, Today we edge. have so many things, holistic healing. But in those days, holistic healing was more uh, followed in Christian science. So uh, yeah. that's very, very interesting. You know? So you, one of the things you brought up about vibrations, and I, I'm studying uh, super string theory. And super string theory is once you get it's way down to the quantum level, it's, uh, the, uh, they haven't proven it yet. The idea that the universe is just little strings <laughs> vibrating. Every, all matter, all energy is just basically little strings vibrating. So in a way, Charles Kellogg, had no idea about super string. It was far beyond, or far after his own time. But I think he would have been something. Uh, that would have been something you'd be really interested in studying because that's right up his alley. Absolutely, he was. He really was a uh, science. He was interested in science, but he wasn't interested in studying it. He wasn't. He knew he wasn't a scholar. Right. He was a man of action, and and whatever he knew, he used that knowledge because that's what worked for him. He was, above all, a very practical person. But I think you're right. I mean, physics today is proving a lot of things that at one time was just considered mysticism. Right. And, you know, the way I relate to his energy is just that he was vibrating so strongly with, with nature and with the environment that his vibration is still there. Mm. And so we tap into that. You know, whatever was Charles Kellogg, whatever energy Charles Kellogg was, it's still available to us to tap into. And that's how I say I communicate with him. I don't have, you know, like today when we went to the house, they said, oh, there's a ghost in the house and we feel the presence. I can believe that because those people were strong. They had strong personalities. 
there's no doubt they left their energy behind in some way. And that's what you tune into. When you feel a spirit in a house, what is it? It's something that is so vital that even when the physical body is gone, somehow something of that energy still remains. A person's personality kind of still <laughs> continues on in, in, in another realm. Yeah, and of course by uh, events like this we keep him alive too, what he represented. Because whoever he was just, you know, in his personal psychology is less important than what he stood for. And what he stood for really is just become conscious of how much we're a part of nature and what we owe nature. And once we spoil that, it won't support us anymore either. So it's not just that, oh, we're protecting nature because nature is something. It's when we protect nature, we protect ourselves and our own extraordinary capabilities. So if he was something, you know, some people think, oh, he's more of a magician than anything. But even magic has to uh, obey the laws of nature on some level. Or the laws of physics. Well, he wasn't a magician. He just understood how to use physics to create illusions. Right, so right. And have fun with the audience and be a celebrity. Yes, and make them also understand that there are more things that are dreamt of in your philosophy, Horatio, right? <laughs> Hamlet. <laughs> There's something beyond. Yeah. There's something more than what we know, whatever we think we know. There's always something beyond that. Well, it sounds like an extraordinary man. It sounds like you're on an extraordinary journey discovering him. Any final words you might want to share about Charles Pell? Well, I'm just really, really grateful to everyone here because the open-heartedness here is also very much a part of who he was. One of the most amazing things that I learned about him this time up in Humboldt was something Dave said to me. And he said, you know, he, what he had found out from the two women who lived in Morgan Hill, they donated the uh, Carlson was their name, I believe, they uh, told him that many people would come to Charles with their problems and he could never turn anyone away and he always tried to help whoever came to him to the best of his ability and he was known later in life as something like a healer in that way. Not in any sort of magical way but just, just by being open hearted, sharing what he knew with others, he helped them. And that's the spirit that I find here okay. in Morgan Hill. A beautiful way to end a great story. So thank you, thank you Roxanne. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you.